On behalf of the Patient Safety Authority, I'd like to welcome you to this web conference titled Medication Errors Attributed to Health Information Technology, a Statewide Analysis of Reported Events. My name is Chris Mamrell, and I'll be your moderator for this program. Now, I'd like to introduce our speaker for the webinar. Matthew Grissinger is the Director of Error Reporting Programs at ISMP and Manager of Medication Safety Analysis for the Pennsylvania Patient Safety Authority. He has published numerous articles in the pharmacy literature, including regular columns in P&T and the PSA Advisory, and is a journal reviewer for the Joint Commission Journal on Quality and Patient Safety, Pharmacoepidemiology and Drug Safety, Therapeutic Advances in Drug Safety, and the Annals of Internal Medicine. Mr. Grissinger serves on the National Coordinating Council for Medication Error Reporting and Prevention, National Quality Forum, Common Formats Expert Panel, Editorial Board for P&T, and the Faculty Advisory Board for the Pharmacy Learning Network. Mr. Grissinger received a BS in Pharmacy from the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy and Science and is a Fellow of the Institute for Safe Medication Practices as well as the American Society of Consultant Pharmacists. Matt, now I'll turn the program over to you. Before we get started, let's just go over the objectives you see in the slide. Uh, we're going to describe in, in the background some ways that health information technology or HIT can contribute to errors. Uh, we're also going to talk about the types of events that were most commonly reported involving HIT uh, that have been reported to the Pennsylvania Patient Safety Reporting System. We'll also talk about the m most common components of HIT that were mentioned in reports sent to the Patient Safety Authority. And also at the end, go over some strategies to address some of the issues that we saw in these reports. So, <clears throat> you know, basically this webinar today is going to be going over an analysis that we performed on data submitted to the Pennsylvania Patient Safety Authority and to the Patient Safety Reporting System. And we'll go over more details of what that analysis looked like, but this is essentially based on reports submitted to the program in Pennsylvania that attributed an, a medication error uh, with an HIT issue. So let's just start with some background material first. Let's talk about what is HIT or health information technologies. And that is probably the broadest term you could possibly think of. When you talk about any technology, at least it was, I mean, for me right now about medication use, uh, think about any technology that's used for medications in the, in the acute care setting or outpatient setting. So we're talking about uh, prescriber order entry systems, or CPOE, the pharmacy order entry systems, automated dispensing cabinets, barcode systems, smart pumps. You could probably even throw in here pharmacy robotics that fill in outpatient pharmacies and inpatient pharmacies, and other type of technology. So again, that phrase HIT is really, really broad um, when we talk about this topic today. Now, when it comes to HIT and how much is being used, now this data you see in a slide is based on um, information in the article down here at the bottom from the American Society of Health System Pharmacists. Uh, every year they do a survey of pharmacy managers across the United States on certain topics. And about two years ago, they surveyed them about the use of health information technology to see how many people actually had these technologies. So you'll see in that survey that more than 97% of hospitals uh, said they implemented a partial or complete electronic health record, 84% used CPOE systems, and nine, almost 94% were using barcode technology. Now, just one caveat to these numbers. The question that they ask is, do you have this? The question is not how well is it being used or is it being used throughout the whole hospital? So when you see that high number of barcoding, I'm not surprised by that, but also that still may mean there's areas in the hospital that aren't using it. Emergency department, procedural areas, the operating room as examples. So just keep that in context of, of the usage, but clearly when we look at these numbers, the use of technology and everyone on the phone has, has lived this, right, has gone up tremendously over the past 10 years. But when we, when we talk about technologies for healthcare, we have to think from a kind of a, a larger perspective because we're not just talking about the equipment. Uh, we're not talking about, not just about the pump, the cabinet, the um, computer monitor and keyboard. We're also talking about the software involved in all that, how it's set up, how well it works, how well it functions, how intuitive it is. It also 
involves the people who are interacting with it. So what do we see? How do we see it? How are we using it? And again, is it intuitive? The workflow, uh, when you enter an order in for a, pres a prescriber, is the workflow, does the workflow make sense? Is it streamlined? And all the other processes associated with technology, think about the purchasing of it, setting it up, all the updates that have to be done, um, including drug libraries and alerts, and all the training that has to go on literally 24-7 in healthcare because of new employees continually coming to your organization having to learn all these technologies. So when you think technology, you have to think larger than just the piece of equipment itself. And it's also important, too, that these systems have some sort of intuitive user interface, although I would probably make the argument that the word intuitive is probably subjective. What's intuitive to me may not be intuitive to Chris, as an example, or vice versa. So I know people strive, the vendors strive to make things intuitive, but that's kind of relative based on our experience, right, of what we used before. I think a third bullet, the user should definitely be able to easily get and retrieve data and also share that information very easily. And we picked up some issues in these reports that show this was not happening. Uh, so when someone is at a computer screen and they're entering information, is it easy to do? Is it easy to find? Um, is it also easy to get data? So if a, a prescriber is entering an order, uh, does he have to get out of the system to go look at the labs? Or is the labs interfaced with the system? It's a classic example. Whether they have to retrieve it or not, or is it already there? And then is it shared? So is it shared across departments as an example? And we have an example of that coming up later on today's presentation. Uh, it's important, obviously, with all those first three bullets, that if all that stuff has not been taken into consideration, the very end of the day, the patient's the ones at risk, right? So if things aren't set up well, designed well, intuitive, people aren't trained in it, et cetera, et cetera, at the end of the day, all this great technology can still lead to patient harm at the end of the day. Okay, so now we're gonna change gears and we're gonna talk about this analysis. I'm sorry, let's talk about errors with uh, HIT first. Uh, one thing you'll see in the slide here, uh, Joint Commission has sent an event alert. It came out just uh, a little over a year ago, right down here, that uh, addressed Sentinel events related to HIT. <clears throat> and at that time, between a three and a half year period, they had 120 HIT related Sentinel events that were reported to the Joint Commission. And in their analysis, or possibly the um, analysis by the organizations, one third of those were attributed to the human computer interface. When you and I are actually sitting at the screen entering information, they're claiming that of all Sentinel events, one third were because of something going on in that interface. While followed by issues with the workflow and communication being communicated from one department to another, and lastly, that by clinical content. Now, you'll, you'll see some literature out there from researchers that will talk about, you know, topically, what are some of the causes of error due to HIT? And after looking at this before this webinar today, I, I don't know if I'm convinced I would call it a cause. You know, so the researchers here are showing, for example, that there, there are four main causes to health HIT errors. A, the system's not available. So uh, you're used to doing everything electronically, but now you lost electricity, so what do you do? The system may malfunction. The system is not being used correctly, or maybe the system's not interacting properly with another system component. There's no interface or connectivity between a and B. And I guess the problem I have with the word cause here is that, you know, when I hear cause in my head, I think root cause analysis. And those four bolts are not root causes, right? If a system is unavailable, yeah, that definitely caused a problem, but why was the system unavailable? If a system malfunctions, yeah, that can lead to a problem, but why did it malfunction? Why was it not used correctly? Why did it not interact properly? So I struggle with calling that uh, cause when there's a lot of reasons for those things to happen. So there are four reasons or buckets of uh, types of errors due to HIT. Obviously, HIT can be, HIT related errors can be exclusive only to IT stuff. And I'm thinking uh, wrong drug errors. You're picking a drug in a smart pump, ADC machine, or order entry system. Uh, you know, one of the biggest problems we're going to see now and going forward is just picking the wrong drug. 
And it's not because of lookalike names per se, but because drug names that start with the same first three letters will accidentally be pecked. Now, and obviously, HRT can contribute to an error that already exists in the former paper world, but it's more likely to occur in the HIT world. And I think that what pops in my head as an example are prescribing errors with wrong patient errors. So, yeah, that happened back in the paper chart days where maybe prescribers write orders on blank order forms that get stamped with the wrong patient's name, that order gets put in the wrong patient's chart, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so the wrong patient errors still have happened in HIT and probably even more likely now because we'll have issues with prescribers having multiple patients open at one time uh, and people pick the wrong one. Uh, I'm sorry, so people have like say five screens open because of phone calls and whatever, and they're supposed to enter an order in patient one, uh, but they had patient two or patient three's profile up. So those are all types of examples. Some things we've seen before, and some things are new and unique to HIT. And I, you know, one thing I want to throw in here in the last slide too, by the way, is this one item here, about the system not interacting properly with the uh, assistant component. And this reminds me of a time going to a hospital on a consult, and we went to a hospital that had a you know electronic health record for the whole organization, the whole hospital, and that was system letter A. Uh, but yet their emergency department had uh, system B, and the uh, PACU had system C. So what that meant was those systems did not interact. So if someone was in PACU after surgery and they got an opioid, like a hydromorphone, and then the person was sent to the floor, both the nurses and pharmacists in the hospital had no idea what opioid they got or dosed because they couldn't see the PACU system. And so they'd actually have to call every time to see what a patient got in the PACU system. So that's a classic example of how things aren't interacting properly or at all. Okay, so now we'll talk about the analysis. Uh, so in, uh, you'll see in April 2015, the safety authority uh, added a new question to the reporting system and, and generically just states, did health IT calls or contribute to the error? I'll have screenshots coming up explaining all of this as well. And I remember I was reading through uh, the Safety Authority puts out an annual report. I was going through the 2016 annual report of 2015 data and noticed just the sheer number of, since the, the, the initiation of that question in April 2015, just the sheer volume of reports that they got in that time period. In fact, I have the annual report here. In three quarters of 2015, there were already 979 medication errors reported in three quarters. And in fact, that number went up 45% from the second quarter of that year, which was the first reporting quarter, up and up to the fourth quarter, that number almost, not doubled, but went up 45% in that time period. So that really brought that to our attention, like kind of impressed by the volume in such a short time period. So we decided to, let's take a look at this specifically. So we're looking at medic, uh, events submitted as medication errors that also checked off the box, did healthcare IT cause or contribute to the event? And so that yielded, in that second bullet, uh, 889 reports in a six month period in that next year. So that was our starting point. So let's look at this, I have screenshots. I hope you can read this okay, it's a little scrunched. But these are screenshots of the actual question. So first we have letter A. A is asking, so what system is it? Okay, so there's administrative things like the master patient index and billing, et cetera. Then there's EHR stuff here, the CPOE, pharmacy systems, EMARs, other documentation systems, clinical decision support, and other stuff here as well. So people can select those. Also miscellaneous, so they had ADCs on here and other items that you see they could choose. Keep in mind, you know, th this question is generalized for all types of events. So it's not just um, medication errors. This applies to all type of error, medical errors, et cetera. So that's why you'll see lab systems, radiology systems on here. Question B is list some of the contributing factors that may have contributed to the issue. And of course, this can't be the be all end all list, right? These are specific HIT things. So for example, was in an issue with the function of the equipment or device, as an example, loss of delay of data, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then the next page continues on to that with ergonomic issues. So for example, 
was a, a data entry selection error where someone picked the wrong thing, like a wrong patient error as an example. Now the miscellaneous type of ones here. And then C asked for the device itself, what was being used, what was the application or device name. And here's where we started running into some issues. And I'll, I'll explain more of this on the next slide here. So keep in mind, keep in mind again what the source of this data is, everyone. It is based on people taking the time, frontline staff, to fill out a medication error report, submitting it internally to the hospital, and that gets sent to the Pennsylvania Patient Safety Authority. So again, the source of the data is who took the time to fill out a report. Okay, so this is not going to be the absolute pinnacle um, ultimate number of all the types of errors with HIT in Pennsylvania. It's just what got reported. And that's important because that, that has a that has some that kind of dictates some of the data and the analysis we did. You know, so for example, when we do the analysis, you know, obviously some of the things we're gonna look at are obviously the medication name, the type of event, wrong patient, wrong drug, wrong dose, overdose, the harm scores, which we'll go over. The last three bullets are what we just went over here in the last three slides. That's where those fields came from. But of all the events, of all the things in this column, what is the most important field? Maybe the event description. So with our analysis, uh, our analysis is not just putting pretty pie charts together and tables together of num raw numbers. It's actually reading the event description to tell you what you told us in the event description. So that can be good, bad, or ugly, depending on what the frontline person dictated into that event description field. And of all the things, and this, this is a take home point for anyone on the phone with air reporting programs, all those database fields you have, easily the most important field is that event description. Because this is where we try to glean more information that you can't simply put into a database field, as an example. So, uh, so that could be good or bad as well, but again, our analysis is based on reading those event descriptions. So let's move on here. It has some pretty bar graphs here to go over some data here. So this is, this is basically the node in the medication use process that the reporting organization selected that were involved in the error. So the, when you, if you add up all those numbers, they will be greater than 889 because you could select multiple nodes. So you'll see here the first, the highest one is prescribing at 38%, followed by administrations next in line, transcribing on down. Uh, what makes this slide somewhat unique to me is if anyone remembers and knows of the probably the original article that talked about the system-based causes of medication errors written by Lucian Leap and David Bates in JAMA in 1995. So when they looked through chart review, looked at the, originate, the originating source of the errors, medication errors at that time, their percents were very eerily similar to this, whereby prescribing administration were definitely one and two, and they were both in a 30% area. So it seems kind of uh, unique that the, these are coming out almost similar, right? Now, there's one other thing to keep in mind with all of this, similar to that same study. So when you look at the prescribing node, and we, so you had so many originate here, but keep in mind with prescribing, you have pharmacy coming up afterwards and nursing coming up to hopefully catch anything that may have gone wrong in that situation, et cetera. So someone was transcribed wrong and it's hopefully a checkpoint to check what was entered wrong. Um, with pharmacy uh, entering orders as an example or using other technologies, there's hopefully the nursing component to catch that. But when errors originate here at the administration end and even monitoring end, who's catching those? Hopefully the nurse. But just keep that in mind, because, uh, you know, in fact, I just saw a report again today of an HIT-related event where at the end of the day, it was definitely an HIT issue, and they blamed the nurse when it had nothing to do with the nurse at all. In fact, the issue was they, they claimed the nurse should have known to call to make sure the enter order was entered when the originating issue was actually upstream is one example. But the other example of this is the fact that if something goes wrong with barcoding, smart pumps here, there's going to be nothing to catch those errors at the end. So the nurses have a lot of responsibility at their end as it is, and literally getting very little help to catch errors, except if they're using the technology correctly. This is just a slide of the HARM scores using the NCC MERP HARM index from the letters A through I. It basically showed a couple key things here. Clearly, very few serious events here. The letter E on up would be serious events in Pennsylvania. 
you count here on, one, on two hands how many serious events were reported in that six-month period with no deaths. Other thing is how many, close, how many good catches there were. So you look at the letters A, B1, B2, uh, you'll, show, you'll see that 30% of these events were categorized as being caught before they reached the patient, while the number of events that reached the patient is roughly or almost 70% of the reports actually, 70% uh, of the reports mention that the error reached the patient here. One more bar graph. So this is just looking at um, the most common drug classes. And of course, you know, this just so happens, you know, at the end of the day, these are the poor drugs that happen to be involved when something went wrong with HIT. So, you know, be careful how you read into this, but that being said, you'll see that obviously antibiotics are number one here in this list as you see, but what's concerning is anticoagulants, opioids, and insulins are three of the top five drug classes. And those three classes represent 25% of all the reports. So you can imagine if something goes wrong with an anticoagulant, you know, ordering anticoag is an example, or an opioid or a simple overdose of insulin uh, can dramatically change its harm score. So it's kind of interesting that the harm scores were so low considering the high alert drugs involved in these cases. Okay, so let's go into more analysis. So that was some high level numbers. Let's dig in and see what we got out of reading the event descriptions. So of all the event types uh, that were reported, the most common one sadly was, of course, everyone has an other event type, right? And lucky for us, guess what was number one? It was others. Uh, so that was required reading all these reports and, and seeing what they told us in the event descriptions. And essentially, the most common theme of the other reports was that uh, over 22% of them mentioned some sort of delay or an omission of therapy. So now you couldn't, add, you couldn't probably take this 42 and add it down here to 123 because they're not all omissions, but that would increase that rate of those emission events and raise that up, potentially up towards 17% of the events. So, so therefore, the second most common type of event was a drug omission. So if the patient did not get the drug that they were supposed to have, wasn't ordered or did not receive a medication that they were intended to get. Uh, unfortunately, re, you know, reading some of these event descriptions, they were not always the most definitively described, telling us what was really going on. So to tr try to come up with sub-bullets or subsections under omissions and all the other event types was somewhat difficult. But we can tell you probably the, the, the most common thing that came out of all the omissions that people specifically stated were issues where the system did not work or, as expected was unavailable to downtime. So the issue being, again, you have electronic order entry systems, you have barcoding out there, and you lose power and you are down for two to three hours, what do you do? How do you handle the situations? How do you write orders? How's pharmacy get the orders? How about the smart pump libraries? Or barcoding, you can't link to the server to uh, verify the patient as an example. What do you do in that downtime? And the key thing is, so the people now who are more and more used to the HIT in the field, they're not used to using paper records. So what does that look like? So I have one example in, in the next slide here. That was, this is the um, uh, event description for an admission event submitted to the, the safety authority. And it says here, during an extended unplanned downtime, the nurse missed giving a midnight dose of medication and essentially says that the nurse was unfamiliar with the paper MAR in handwritten documentation. So very short event description, but kind of boy, in two sentences tells you exactly what's going on here is, What's the downtime procedure? And we're gonna come back and talk about that at the end of the presentation because, boy, every day we go by, everyone, the more important this is with the more technology we have in our organizations. So the third most common event type now will be uh, what is called wrong dose slash overdoses or you know, any, over, any, any over dosages that a patient may have received. So you'll see the most common um, thing there of the 10 point, I'm sorry, 10.9 percent events being the overdoses. Of those, the most common theme that came out of the overdoses involved issues with incorrect weights, which has been a recurring theme in, with the Patient Safety Authority and two past advisories with errors in patient weights, as well as with ISMP. And in this situation here, you'll see this person probably got over a threefold overdose. Uh, it says the determined that the patient's weight was incorrect. 
It was entered as 148 kilograms after asking us to verify the corrected weight was entered the next day as 46 kilograms. And of course, they had a weight-based order for anoxaparin or lovenox that was given based on that first 146 kilogram weight. But now here's the issue. So we know clearly something wrong going here with weights, right? But I don't quite understand where the 148 came from. And so that's why when we talk about whether it was HIT related or not, we don't know the specifics in this case of what that meant, right? So, you know, when I first, my first glance at this, I'm thinking they clearly estimated a weight and didn't weigh them until later. That's where the 46 came from, from weighing someone. And it almost, to me, comes across as they estimated the weight at 148 pounds. But I don't know. I'm just, I'm totally guessing at that. You know, was this an issue where there's was a electronic health record and they just missed entered 148? for whatever reason. It could have been something as simple as that. It may be, and we have seen issues where both on paper and in systems, they'll have both a pound and kilogram field. That could have been an issue as well. Maybe they meant to enter as 140 pounds, even though it may have been estimated, but get entered as 148 kilograms. So we're gonna come back and talk about weight at the end too on one slide because this is a huge issue and Sometimes our HIT systems, the way we have them set up, are making the issues uh, worse more than better. Okay, so next um, most common event type is the last one we're gonna talk about. The fourth most common one were expert doses, uh, where someone you know got a single dose and then got another dose on top of that for whatever reason. And the most common thing that came out of this were issues, and this is gonna come back again later today, where doctors or prescribers were quote unquote, free texting instructions as a communication order or component of an order, but not actually as the directions themselves. And more importantly, you'll see in the slides, it had to do with issues with holding or discontinuing medication. So, you know, let's take a step back here. If anyone has issue, you know, obviously every organization has orders where a patient's gonna be, a medication's gonna be held for a patient. And the key issue is what is the process that you have in place to quote unquote, hold a drug. You know, in our viewpoint, the order should just be discontinued. The hold order means the order is stopped for today and may be restarted tomorrow, but a hold is still a dis discontinued order. So essentially, these orders should be discontinued. And that would solve the problem. But instead, uh, prescribers were instead sending communications electronically in other places, but not through the order entry area or just essentially de the order. And we're gonna come up, uh, we'll talk about this again, about the issue of free texted fields. Uh, Cause we run into this, especially in the outpatient setting, just as much as the inpatient setting. So we'll come back to that later, but, but keep in mind the issues of where, how things are being communicated in the first place. So here's one example here. A patient's INR was elevated at uh, four, a physician was notified and a message was entered, but the warfare was not discontinued. Now seeing a third bullet, so, since it was not an official order, but it was sent as a communication, the dose wasn't discontinued in the, the electronic MAR because, again, it was entered as a message somewhere else versus just going into the order, ordering screens and discontinuing it. And therefore, because that DC wasn't communicated properly, it was missed because it wasn't where everyone else was expecting it to be entered. And so this is kind of a bigger issue, organizationally speaking, of how do you, you know, what fields do you have to enter things in, and how should orders officially be communicated? You know, order entry, order entry systems, not just about entering orders, it's also about removing orders as well. Okay, so let's move on from the event types. Let's talk about other issues we saw in this data. Uh, so when you talk about the components that people listed, when you could check off the EHR component involved in that one screen I showed you with the types of stuff, you'll see the most common things that were selected uh, were CPOE, um, pharmacy systems, along with EMARS as well. And, again, and so, which is kind of interesting, by the way, because we'll come back to another advisory we wrote for the Safety Authority that showed, uh, in the regard to overrides, which did not show this at all. It showed totally different things involved. So it's kind of interesting what's selected here, by the way. And again, keep in mind, everyone, this is still relying on people filling out a report in a hospital at the end of the day. So again, you see a few most common things here. Now let's match those up with the most common event types. And so you get this here. So this is essentially, you'll see the 
type of system down at the bottom here, CPOE, pharmacy, EMARs, et cetera. And then the colors are the most common event types, emissions, extra doses, and wrong dose overdose. So you'll see same patterns, right? Omission is the highest among all three here, and all three systems. Extra doses are the second most common thing in all, all the um, types of HIT, followed by the overdoses as well. Um, so, you, so therefore, but you can see how many omissions again occur with the any system. So even though it may come across as a, or a computerized prescriber order entry system, now that applies to a lot of things. It's not just unique to one type of HIT. The other further analysis, and this is kind of interesting because um, the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology in the U.S. government had a report in 2014 that had very similar findings to what we saw in Pennsylvania, whereby in PA, according to the reporters, the most common contributing factor was um, in regard to data entry or selection errors. So over, almost 40% of the patient data was that. And also, of all the CPOE errors down here, almost half of CPOE errors were simply, and I'm putting that in quotes, right, data entry or selection errors. And so that goes back to uh, how about we talk about picking the wrong drug again and how easy that is to do, and picking the wrong patients. So those would be data entry selection errors, which really aren't difficult to do in this HIT world. But again, what's difficult here is, despite this data, we don't know the specifics here. We don't know what specifically about that monitor, that screen, that program, or the technology of why we picked the wrong thing. Again, was it a drop-down list? Was it how things were displayed? Was it the layout of the screen? Was the person picking something being distracted, interrupted? Were they in a quiet environment? So there's a lot of things. Just keep that in mind. I know you see some nice data here, but we don't know the specifics because we weren't told the specifics of what was going wrong here. We just know it was a selection error, and here's what this selected wrong, as an example. Other things, so we looked at all the HIT errors, all 889, you know, other common themes we saw overall among all of them were obviously um, communication issues. And so you see 56 errors were identified as communication issues. Uh, again, almost 70% were due to prescribers, free texting instructions and order comment fields, which is a separate field from this, uh, the, the direction field, or us pharmacists, we call it the SIG field. That's an old Latin abbreviation. Uh, more than a third of the free text orders, again, involved holding or discontinuing meds. So two things here, and this really also, if you have outpatient pharmacies, by the way, or even though if you know people work in a retail setting, I'm going to tell you, this really gets pharmacists because in these prescriber order entry systems, they'll have a direction field, and then they'll have a separate comment field. And what happens at times is, the real directions get put in the comment field, and they put something else bogus in the direction field as an example. And as pharmacists and as nurses, we, listen, we're trained to look at the direction field. That's the number one thing we're gonna look at. So we need to let prescribers know the end result, you know, what, where they have to enter stuff first off, but then what is the end result? What, you know, doctors don't know what we see, and it's probably a lot of times that nurses and pharmacists don't know what doctors are seeing at their end. So I think we need to have a communication back and forth so we know how one person's actions affect someone else's actions here, and to know what the end result here is as well. But there's too many times where we've seen, uh, again, literally two separate directions in a direction field and comment field that even contradict themselves, that make things worse. And again, uh, we talked issue, earlier about the issue of holding or de meds. The, the, those are not comments, they should not be direction, they should be discontinued orders, period. And that would, that would take care of a lot of the, some of the events we saw here in regards to communication issues. The second most common place, and that should be electronic health record, but Microsoft always autocorrects EHR, by the way, to that. Um, second most common place in an EHR were, again, communication orders or nursing communication orders where it was like a messaging function in a way between a prescriber and a nurse, but that's not an official order. Okay, and, and therefore, and, and in my opinion, nurses aren't the secretaries of the prescribers either. They're not, they should not be the ones then, then relaying that information, when, especially when the order could just simply been DC'd. So here's one communication example that goes with that. 
A uh, patient has had chest pain in a recent stent. The doctor ordered a heparin bolus, so he told the nurse the patient needed heparin drip. But the physician placed the heparin drip as a nursing miscellaneous communication, not as an actual order. And so since it wasn't entered as an actual order, therefore the whole chain of events that occur electronically don't take place, right? So that therefore is not an order communicated to pharmacy to enter the drug. That is not an order dropping into the EMAR for the nurse to give the drug. And potentially in this situation, the order does not then go to the ADC machine to allow the person to take out the heparin in that person's name. So one little, you know, putting this in the wrong spot has a whole cascade of events and who's entering this order at the end of the day? It wasn't entered correctly, so who's doing that? Who's catching this? And who's entering the order at the end of the day? So it seems like a minor simple fix here, but again, we have to, when it comes to order entry systems for prescribers, we have to look at what fields they have and it's okay to have comment fields, but we all have to understand the purpose of that comment field. Another topic here is with alerts. Now, this is kind of interesting because, listen, and I gave this webinar to another hospital recently, and clearly everyone is battling with the problem with alerts, right? Uh, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that little, uh, in a couple slides here. Uh, it was interesting that of all these 889 reports, only 21 reports mentioned, issue, mentioned that an alert fired and then insinuating something went wrong with that. It seems kind of funny knowing what the problem is out there with the overuse of alerts, that how few got reported. And so you'll see 20 reports mentioned that um, 26, 20 reports mentioned 26 alerts for either a, pr a prescriber, a pharmacist, or a nurse. And occasionally there are situations where they alerted for more than one person and was not uh, considered as well. Of all, also, of all these 26 alerts, 21 of the alerts mentioning event descriptions uh, led to nothing happening. So essentially, someone got an alert that said, hey, watch out, and that was blown off for whatever reason as well. Another sad uh, situation is here, number four. Four reports from three different hospitals explicitly mentioned that alerts for prescribers have been disabled by the health system. So that is a huger problem as well of, you know, again, addressing, disabling all the alerts is not helping anybody, even though I understand why people do that. They get new CPOE system, they want doctors to buy into it, so we acquiesce and turn all the alerts off for them, and I understand that. But keep in mind, keep in mind what must be going on in these reports, everyone, that the person filling out the report took the time to explicitly state the problem occurred because we disabled these alerts. What are your employees saying about that? So just keep in mind, it's interesting how sometimes these reports will come out and tell you some really larger cultural issues when you describe problem A, and really the problem is B because culturally speaking, we have an issue with this health system. Last bullet, uh, 26 reports specifically mentioned that no alert fired, which, meant, which implies that they were relying on these alerts to help them out and were expecting alerts but didn't get an alert. And 30% of, uh, of those 26 reports result in a patient getting an extra dose. And they should have an alert to say, whoa, stop, and it did not happen. So that's interesting. So that relates to another advisor we wrote, and it came out here December 2015. Uh, and in that analysis, what we did was we searched the Pennsylvania database for any medication error where it, within the event description, they mentioned the words like, overrode, overridden, et cetera, et cetera, so that type of thing. And we did analysis of reports where they mentioned an override. Uh, one thing that's interesting to see here, only 12% of them uh, involve CPOE or pharmacy order entry systems. Now that other slide we had showed that those systems accounted for almost 80% of the reports for this HIT errors, but yet in the override one, it came down as only 12% which is somewhat fascinating to me, uh, knowing, that that's, knowing that the overrides are happening in the systems, right? Uh, so in that, in that advisory, the uh, most common type of alerts that were overridden were allergies, duplicate drug therapies, and wrong doses as well. So that was uh, a little disconcerting as well. Of those overrides, a third of them involved high alert meds with anticoagulants being the most common one. Uh, in that same advisory from 2015, 
almost 20% of the Highland Med reports involved overrides of both the doctor and the pharmacy, whereby the doctor got an alert, overrode it, pharmacist got an alert, and I'm assuming, probably thinking, well, the doctor got this, so if he overrode it, it must be fine. So how does your organization handle that? From the, from the system-wide view, what alerts do doctors get, and which ones do pharmacists get? And so should pharmacists always react to every alert? But what happens if the doctor already reacted to the alert appropriately and said it was okay? Does pharmacy know that? Because that's either going to lead to ignoring the alert or all these phone calls, and both aren't good. Another, uh, another disconcerting thing as well is this last bullet. In that advisory, of the reports that cited only CPOE systems, 12% of them explicitly mention that other people besides prescribers, like unit secretaries and nurses, were entering the orders into the system. And I also have huge concerns about that because, you know, in your organization, a doctor calls in a phone order to a nurse, you expect the nurse to enter the order, okay? So when a doctor's calling in, how does the doctor know the complete patient medication profile? Does he see the labs? Does he see the allergies? Other patient conditions that would affect that drug? The nurse enters the order and gets an alert. How's that handled? So you're putting a lot of prescribing decision making into the nurse's hands or your unit secretary's hands. So for those out there, keep this in mind. You know, order entry is not, I know at times we perceive it as a clerical job, it's a clinical job. It's not just the issue of entering the order in a computer system, it's the reviewing of the order for appropriateness and the med profile, et cetera. So the fact that they came out and, and mentioned that the, uh, these errors were involving other people is somewhat concerning. Okay, so let's go over some limitations of this, of what we just did and strategies and we'll be done here. So you know, here are some limitations of what we did. So again, keep in perspective what we're talking about. We're talking about a reports filled out by frontline staff, predominantly nursing and pharmacy, very little if any prescribing. And so we're at the mercy of the quality of that report. Good, bad, and ugly involved like the event description. So yeah, the narrative fields were, were very helpful at times to figure out more specifically what happened Event descriptions rarely, rarely tell you why the error happened. Uh, but they definitely did not contain all the HIT-related contributing factors. In regards to the vendors and stuff like that, they were rare, They were all over the board. A lot of people don't know what they're using or say if it was an order entry system, what version it was. So if you ask me, Matt, where are the top three vendors involved in these reports? We couldn't tell you because it wasn't really given to us very well. And the event descriptions did not clarify what's normal and not normal in, a, in an organization. Um, it did, again, didn't tell us about the maker model of the HIT system. And it's interesting, so the people found out the report will word things for, the, for people within that hospital. So they know they use, the, I'm going to say Epic or Cerner, and we all know what their issues are in that hospital with that system. But when we read it, I don't know what you have, right? So it's tough to interpret what you mean. You know what you mean. I don't know what you mean. So you're getting some of that. You're getting kind of the whisper down the lane type of stuff here. Other, other limitations. Uh, so this is a brand new question that was introduced in 2015. But in Pennsylvania, you know, people still can use their own commercial reporting programs for all their event data, and then they can interface with Pennsylvania, the Patient Safety Authority's reporting system and dump the, you know, send those reports or copy the reports into the Pennsylvania database. So if their reporting system didn't have that question, they didn't answer the question, right? So then approximately half the facilities in Pennsylvania have an interface. So that, so there, believe me, there could be a lot of reports we're missing out on as well. So this is a little limited by the people who are actually were using that patient's question and sending and actually filling it out. And also, listen, there's only six months of data, right? Uh, we kind of jump on this earlier than later. So and it's also the January to June time period. So in theory, say for the CPOE issues, technically speaking, people who are residents or students who are using the order entry systems would probably be more adept at using it the second half of the academic year than the first half of the academic year, right? So we even consider that piece of it as well. Again, knowing that the numbers we got here are really probably underreported, so I'm not sure if we would see that visual difference or not in our data. 
All right, let's talk some strategies here to, to wrap this up. And I have a lot of time for questions here. So a um, couple things. Number one, training. So what's training look like, everyone? All the technology. But more importantly, how do you know they're competent in using that technology? Whether it's a brand new purchase or something you have already in place, what are the processes in place to assess competency, including prescribers, everyone, including doctors and nurses and pharmacists? using and technologies. How do, we, how do you know that you're comfortable enough to let them loose to use those technologies? Clearly encourage people to report issues they see, the unsafe conditions, the close calls. Develop some mechanism in your organization to, to get a hold of these. It may or may not be through an air reporting process. To me, as long as it's a simple process, that, and, and you have to show interest in getting these events as well, but how are you gathering them to even get those potential errors addressed early rather than waiting for something to go wrong? Identify workarounds that staff may use. Uh, keep in mind, there's still a reason why they're working around it. Don't blame the frontline staff for doing a workaround. Uh, there's a reason why they think they have to work around it. So what is that reason? And correct those system flaws to eliminate the workarounds and let people know what you changed. We mentioned this earlier, how about downtime again? What are your processes in place? If you're a joint commission accredited organization, that's part of the uh, standards, the emergency preparedness, all right, what do you do? And how often do you test it? It's one thing to have a policy. You know, offense policy doesn't mean anything. When that time comes and electricity's out, nobody's breaking out the policy procedure here. They're trying to figure out how to enter an order. So how do you test it, all these scenarios, you know, on a, well, routine basis, maybe it's annually, but keep in mind, most people are going to be caught off guard when that happens. How do you monitor your, your technology use? You know, these systems can allow for a generation of many reports, or should have that potential, of number of alerts that you get, number of overrides that you have. What are the most common alerts that you have that you can get rid of? You know, some, of these, some of these reports can help you remove and get rid of alerts more than anything else as well. So what type of data are you using to analyze your HIT? If something goes wrong, are you doing an RCA? And are you also including any IT people in that RCA? Keeping in mind, it's not just HIT's fault. There's other things involved with that higher level, implementation, setup, training, interruptions. So it's more than just blaming the frontline person or the computer system. And try to reduce the need for a manual human interface meaning me having to log out to go get labs, log it back in and get patient information, should be kind of seamless on one screen. Patient waits, please, you, we need to stop weighing people in pounds. Uh, there's been, we, the, the safety authority has plenty of evidence that the, there are issues with measuring people in pounds. So A, what do your HIT systems have in regard to documenting weight of getting actual, not estimated weights in kilograms? In regard to displays, what do drug names look like? Um, just in general, do people need reading glasses to read order entry screens? How big is the font? What's the layout look like? Can you use tall man lettering? Keep in mind, you know, we'll often blame look like names for wrong drug errors. Uh, no offense, it's not look like names. There's gonna be drug to begin the first three same first three letters that are the same. It may not look alike. So what does that look like? Try limiting distractions as well. If for doctors doing order entry, leave them alone. Nurses pulling drugs from ADC machine, programming a smart pump, leave them alone. Let them accomplish their tasks without interruptions. Same for pharmacists as well. They should have interruption-free zones for doing order entry and having someone else answer phone calls as an example. And also, this would, you know, using HIT would really encourage standardizing your processes, right? Standardizing concentration, standardizing your formulary and the drugs in your formulary and all the guidelines and order sets that go with the drug or condition. And keep in mind that these uh, order sets are not just about ordering a drug, they're tr for treating a condition. So what condition is it for? What drugs are you gonna use for that condition? How you monitor the effects of that condition or on the order form? If you have to reverse the patient, something goes wrong, how do you reverse the effects of the drug? What labs would you order, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, standardized order sets are not just about the drug, it's all the things associated with the care that affect doctors, pharmacists, and nurses. You know, obviously, you know, we could have probably a whole hour webinar on alerts, right? So here's a key thing. And believe it or not, 
and, uh, and I feel sad that every hospital has to do this on their own. I think it, it's somewhat unfair that the vendors put us in this position that, you know, obviously drug information vendors have to have alerts for everything to cover their you-know-what for liability reasons. So when we turn on all the alerts, you get all the alerts. That doesn't make them all good or relevant to you. It is okay to turn off alerts that aren't meaningful. So can you run a report? What are the most common pairs of drugs that trigger alerts? Do they need to be triggered? Can we turn some of those off? And conversely, are there some that should never be overridden? Which one should have hard stops? So think about the data you can get first to prove the problem and then attack it from there. We talk about the whole issue of free texting, so address how free texting is happening in your organization. Uh, other technologies, and I'll run through this just so we have time for questions. Um, ADCs, uh, make sure they're in a limited interruption-free zone. Make sure they're also pharmacy profile where drugs cannot be removed until a pharmacy approves the orders. Smart pumps, you know, we, and you, well, many of you have this, so make sure the library is standardized as an example. Um, also standards nomenclature, for example, the dosing, microgram per kilogram versus microgram per kilogram per minute. Um, again, use data for smart pumps here. And the conclusions, because I don't want to have time for questions. Um, listen, errors can happen all over the place with technology, right? I mean, we barely touched it today. But keep in mind, that phrase HIT is huge. And there are all these issues could be similar and they could all be different. But there's really be open-minded about all the HIT components. Uh, listen, sometimes uh, failures with HIT systems are blamed on humans, which is not very good because you're kind of closing your eyes to the system problem that everyone could be falling for. Just because a doctor enters a wrong order, I'm sure that a lot of the doctors have fell for the same trick or same issue with your screens or how things looked. So you gotta really make sure you're to stop blaming the frontline people for once and take a look at yourselves and what, what as a system, you're contributing to the problem. Obviously, there's gonna be human interface errors as well where we can overlook things or miss things as well. So what are the reasons why we're missing things? Think of it, always ask those questions why this is happening. Um, obviously, errors occur when system the system downtime or didn't work as expected, but lastly, you know, that interaction between the frontline staff who's ever using this, the HIT and the system itself is really important, that whole interaction. And so, but it's a big, there's a lot of things involved in that interaction we talked in the beginning of the presentation. It's not just the HIT system, it's not just the person, it's a lot of things, uh, including from leadership, that contribute to the problems here. So make sure we're looking at the big picture with HIT issues. So on that note, Chris, I'm gonna pass it back to you. Great, thank you, Matt. Uh, that presentation was very informative and I think it contained valuable information that everyone can use in their organization. This does conclude our slide presentation portion of the program and we'd like to now begin our question and answer period. Do have some questions already, Matt. Uh, are, are you aware of any research on HIT and medication errors specific to long-term care facilities? Chris, that's a really good question and I'm gonna say I'm not familiar with it not, and that doesn't mean it's not out there, but I will say that's another area that needs to be looked at in long-term care. That's a very good question. And Chris, to tell you what the concern we have is, is that in the long-term care facility setting, uh, there's no pharmacies in, inside nursing homes. And so, and also the communication process in nursing homes is predominantly doctors calling in orders to nurses. Doctors don't go to nursing homes every day. They go once a month probably. So there's a, a tremendous amount of verbal orders, which means practically all the orders are entered by nurses in nursing homes. And the problem with that is, I give Chris the verbal order, Chris enters into the computer system. What's the pharmacy checking? Pharmacy's not checking the original verbal order, they're checking what the nurse put in, and how would the pharmacist know if it was put in correctly? So there's a lot, I have a lot of concerns with HIT and long-term care, the way it's set up, but. I don't know if there's research out there, but I hope there is, because that definitely needs to be looked at. Thank you. Uh, the next question is kind of a comment, and I'll let you maybe expand on this. Uh, but when both the prescriber and pharmacist override system alerts, this means that the RN does not get an alert when administering the med. Is that common from what you've seen? Well, you know, it's one of the things, I'm thinking about the alerts that pharmacists and doctor would override. So I'm thinking predominantly drug interactions, therapeutic duplications, stuff like that. 
And, you know, I personally think the nurse has way too many things on their plate as it is that I would not want that on the EMR, Chris. I mean, we have to address the issue why it was overridden by the prescriber and pharmacy. The nurse has to catch so many errors as it is that now it sounds like we're going to dump more alerts on the nurse. And I'm just not comfortable with that. Uh, we should, you know, again, and I'm not, I'm not meant to put down a nurse in any way, shape, or form. They have enough things to do, and they're already catching enough problems that we have two other practitioners who miss things. That has to be addressed first. I, don't, I personally would not want a, yet another drug interaction alert coming up for the nurse, because which means, alert comes up, Chris, nurse has to stop giving meds, go to the, the nursing station, make phone calls, and again, they're away from the patients, taking care of problems that should have been addressed earlier. Yeah. Um, the question about any resources either within the Patient Safety Authority or other organizations that have guidance requirements and resources to, to support and encourage in this type of work both within hospitals and vendors uh, in improving these issues. Yeah, I think there's probably a lot of resources out there. We, you know, the PSA has written some articles over the years addressing HIT-related issues. Uh, but not, but and same for ISMP, but they're not really guidances of how to do some of this stuff. But I would refer to organizations like AHRQ, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, who have a lot of research on HIT stuff, and also the um, American Medical Informatics Association, uh, AMIA, and they have a journal, JAMIA. I would refer to them first, but that being said, you know, guidances for ADCs like ISMP has. But those organizations may not have guidance for smart pumps, et cetera. So it depends on the technology, Chris. I know ICP has some with smart pumps and ADCs as an example, um, but I don't think all the technologies, especially order entry systems, are really being covered. Okay. Uh, this is a question this facility uses pharmacist entered orders um, for pharmaceutical orders, uh, sometimes a verbal order written by a nurse and faxed over or sent over. Uh, to the pharmacist. Have you noticed any problems related to pharmacist order entry? I know you mentioned nurse and uh, unit secretary. Well, it's interesting. At least, you know, at least based on this data, no. And uh, so I'm not saying pharmacists are perfect. You know, I am a pharmacist, by the way. But uh, <laughs> yeah, but I will say, you know, you have to think, but it's something interesting. I don't know if people realize this. You know, me as a pharmacist, I have been using pharmacy order entry systems back when I was a student back in the mid-1980s. So as pharmacists, we've been entering orders by computer for decades and decades, while doctors are, like, new on board. So I just think the experience has to play some some role in this as well. Uh, but, hey, at the end of the day, when picking a wrong drug error off a drop-down list, the doctor, pharmacists, and nurses are going to make the same type of error because the first three letters are the same. So they're not being reported. Uh, it also, I guess the other thing, Chris, too, in, term, in a normal pharmacy, there's a lot of double checks in place within a pharmacy. So if a pharmacist enters an order, there's going to be a second person double checking the original order with what was entered. So the verbal order piece may get caught. But that being said, you know, I can understand some concerns, again, of the same thing when a nurse gets the order and has to write it down and enter it as well. That could still be an issue as well. But it's just... I don't see as many reported in pharmacy, probably because of experience, and probably because they're not being reported, too. Huh, thank you, Matt. Uh, I'm going to do one last question because we're just about out of time. Uh, this is when you talked about alerts and the disabling of alerts. How are you sure that the health system disab disabled all the alerts and weren't just determining either correctly or incorrectly that those alerts were counterproductive and disabling just specific ones? Yeah. Hey, you know, hey, that's a very good question, uh, and you know something because there, there are definitely organizations do making that attempt to do that. I'm just in, in this specific case, in these specific specific reports that were submitted, the reporter specifically took the time to say that. Uh, so I'm going to accept that as the truth in those. And again, it was only four reports, by the way, out of all these reports. So. Yeah, keep in mind, everyone on the phone, that we're all at different stages in the life of HIT. Some of us have had the time to do what that person just said, to weed out the alerts and get rid of the bad ones and all that stuff. Some people haven't, everyone. There's some people out there who are just starting off this journey today trying to get rid of the alerts. So that's the issue, too. So just keep in mind, we are still, we're not in the same playing field anyway. Great. Thank you.
This concludes our webinar.